Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Can you, oh, Hi. Can you nice hear to meet me you. Now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, Thomas. It's a pleasure having you here. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation. No problem. Okay. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> so, uh, Arit, you tell me when we are starting, okay? Yes, we can start whenever you like. Yes. Okay. Okay. okay so, so it's a pleasure for me uh, to introduce Thomas Huber. Thank you, everybody, for attending uh, this seminar. Uh, can you go to the next next slide, uh, Arit? Yes, so this this talk is the fourth in the in this season in the series of webinar that the EAT Center is organizing again. Um, and uh, to me for me is a very is a special one uh, because uh, this is the first one on the on on a speech. No, where the subject is specifically speech. The previous has been have been uh, about natural subjects or in the field of natural language processing, but uh, this is in the field of speech, and in particular in the 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 talk, uh, the title of the talk is computational models of speech learning, uh, a focus on acoustic articulatory mapping. So, uh, Dr. Huber is an expert on, on the subject of mapping articulatory characteristics to acoustic parameters. Uh, having, he has been working in this subject on, for a long time. I think he, he worked very early with silent speech interfaces with when the, this was really very innovative and very new in the field of speech. Uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, he was awarded with the Christian Benoit uh, uh, Prize of ISCA, which is a prize who is, uh, that is given to young researchers uh, who have a very promising future who has been demonstrated, I think. And um, also he, uh, I think you have been working, uh, applying in the, in the late, uh, latest years, applying deep neural networks to, deep neural networks based models to this, uh, to this field. Um, he is now the head of the research team Cognitive Robotics, Interactive Systems, and Speech Processing from the Gipsa Lab in Grenoble. Gipsa Lab is a very well-known unit research of uh, CNR, CNRS in France. So I'm very, very glad that uh, he accepted this invitation and then we are able to to listen to what he's going to to say um i am sure it's going to be very interesting and we are going to learn a lot so i'm giving you the floor thomas it's uh, your turn so thank you very much for for first the, the invitation uh uh, in Ma and and also uh, thank also uh, Aris uh, Farwell because I uh, we, uh, for, also for the invitation. Uh, thank you for this very nice introduction. Um, so let's talk about speech. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm going to share my um, screen. So after two years of pandemic, I'm still discovering new software like WebEx. So. I'm not fluent in WebEx for now, but I we checked and 
So can you see the slides? Yes. Okay, everybody can hear me loud and clear. Yeah. And can you see the cursor moving? Yes. Okay, cool. So I can show you, show some things. Okay. So again, thank you for this very nice introduction. Uh, it's a, it's a pleasure to to talk about my work, which, as you will see, it's uh, more like a collaborative work. Research uh, is a uh, is a uh, is a sport that we are doing with other people. So it's a uh, it's a collaborative work that I'm very happy to to present. So my talk is entitled a "Computational Model of Speech Learning with a Focus on uh, Acoustic to Artificial Mapping." Uh, before I just before I start, um, I just um, um, just to say a few words about uh, the team. So as you said, I'm I'm head of uh, a, a one of the research team at, at Gipsa Lab, the CRIS team, which stands for uh, Cognitive Robotics, Interactive System, and Speech Processing. Um, so uh, we basically are speech processing guys uh, with a background in uh, let's say. Um, uh, speech synthesis first, with all the related topic of speech synthesis. Uh, also, um, also most of the projects are related to multimodality in speech. Whenever you have different modalities involved, and we know that for sure uh, speech is multimodal. So when it comes to captures multimodal speech signals, model them and transfer them into uh, avatars or uh, robots, uh, this is basically what we are interested in in the team. Uh, also, some work on low-level speech processing, speech enhancement, and source separation. And today, I will focus on what I've been interested in the last few years, which is speech production and modeling the underlying mechanisms that, uh, of speech production. Uh, and of course, this is a nice view of, uh, of, of Grenoble, which is, uh, as you know, uh, surrounded by a nice mountain with, uh, with snow uh, as today. Um, Okay, so let's focus on, on, on speech production. And as you know, or you, maybe you don't know, but speech production is a complex motor process. Motor process because uh, it involved several um, motor commands that are conveyed through different uh, streams of physiological signals that are sent by the brain and that will activate uh, different organs uh, in the human body, starting, of course, by the respiratory system that will provide the energy of the speech sounds. And this uh, airflow coming from the respiratory system will go through the, uh, the larynx uh, and will be shaped by the action of the vocal folds. And here we are not really into speech, more into voice, and then voices then transform into the speech signals uh, uh, when it resonates in the vocal tract and the oral cavities of the vocal tract. And in the in this the, the properties, the acoustic property of this cavity will be modulated by the movement of what we call the speech articulators, that are tongue, lips, velum, and the jaw. And the movement of these articulators, coupled with the shape of the vocal tract cavities, the oral cavities, will start to shape this airflow. And so that we will uh, uh, create really the speech in terms of the building blocks of language, which can be, of course, uh, phonemes and then the phoneme um, con concatenated together will bring uh, we go, we create some words and sentences etc. So we have all the link all the linguistics levels that will be encoded in the speech signal uh, in the acoustic speech signal. And uh, when it comes now to developmental learning and if we think about this very nice uh, uh, child, actually my daughter when she was two. Uh, when she has to learn how to uh, how to speak, she has to uh, learn the complex relationship between different modalities. Modalities that are, of course, the acoustics, the acoustic modality, because she's surrounded by by ambient speech, and of course she has to learn what are the building blocks and all the different linguistic levels within this acoustic signal. So from phonetic up to morphology. Up to of course, of morphology and syntax up to up to the semantic and pragmatic level, but she has to speak and she has to speak. So she has to activate and uh, she has to produce speech and to produce speech. She has to learn the relationship between the sound that she wants to produce the acoustic target she, has to, she wants to achieve and the motor command that she has to send to produce these speech signals. And so she has to learn this relationship that we have between acoustic and uh, articulatory or motor command. 
So in my talk, I will focus on this link between articulatory level and acoustic articulatory mapping. So this uh, acoustic to articulatory mapping, uh, so recovering motor command from the acoustic speech, speech signals, um, is um, actually has a major role in both speech perception and production. So here I will just review um, like the, the main uh, series of uh, speech perception and speech production to try to convince you that this uh, mapping from acoustic to articulatory data or articulatory movements uh, plays a major role. If we think about speech perception, first, so how we perceive speech, we know for, for a long time that articulatory input helps decoding speech in adverse conditions. So when we are perceiving speech in noise, we rely on articulatory movements and the most common articulator and the most uh, the, the articulator that, uh, that we have all in mind is lip movement. Uh, we know that for sure that it helps, uh, you know, perceiving speech in noise, but it is probably less known that we also can benefit from direct visualization of the tongue, as shown by Badin and colleagues, or also tactile information, uh, as shown by, by, or as reviewed by, by Trey uh, quite recently. But also, if we now think about the main theory uh, underlying speech perceptions, and in particular, the motor or perceptual motor series of speech perceptions, all those theory uh, um, states that an auditory representation here, as shown in this uh, figure here on the, the right, auditory representations are transformed via uh, a series of um, like complex phenomena that I won't be able to detail first, and I won't detail in this talk, through a complex um, a sequence of prediction and predictive coding mechanisms and estimations are uh, transformed into a set of motor representations. So it means that when we perceive speech, we somehow access automatically to motor uh, uh, representations. So we can say in, in short, very short, that when we perceive uh, auditory uh, stimulus, we try to repeat it in our hand. So we do uh, do the, we, we perform this transformation between um, acoustic on one hand and articulatory on the other hand. So this is for speech perception. Now when it comes to speech production, so when we look to the literatures on motor control and uh, more particular on speech motor control, we have many models uh, starting from the one uh, proposed by Gunther via the DIVA model or UDE in the SFC model or recently by Perrier and colleagues. Most of these models of speech motor control, they assume the existence of the, what they call an inverse model. The inverse model transforms an acoustic target into a set of motor command. So to understand what this inverse model is about, we can also see other models of motor control, not for speech, but uh, for uh, any kind of, uh, of uh, motor control, and especially this uh, very general model by Wolfert and, and Garamani. And you can see in this figure, for instance, that this uh, person wants to execute a movement and the, the goal is defined in terms of, it's a visual goal, he wants to bring this ball closer to, to, his, to his head. And so to do that, so he has to transform this perceptual objective into a set of motor command. And this is where this inverse model is uh, used, because here you are, we have an, an in perceptual input, we have to inverse it into a set of motor commands and we execute movements and then we have some kind of sensory feedback here okay when we execute the command we have some uh, we execute the motor command sorry and we have some some sensory feedback here so we can see if we are happy with the execution of the movement or if we have to correct it okay so basically how we control a movement and it's the same for the speech uh, it's a combination of inverse modeling starting from some acoustics, inverse it into a set of motor commands, executing the movements, and, uh, and, 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 and monitor online or correcting online the, the, the movement. So I will come back, uh, I will come back uh, at the end of my talk on, on, on more, more um, specific model of, of speech motor control. But the take home message here is that we need to learn this acoustic to inverse uh, uh, mapping when we want to learn how to speak. And we use it when we perceive speech and when we produce speech. The problem is that it's not so simple to learn this acoustic to articulatory mapping because it is also well known for a long time that it's a nil post problem, mathematically speaking. So it means that the relation between the acoustic signals to the sound and the articulatory movements, gestures, 
is a many to one relation. So if you are not convinced about that, you can start to produce the vowel U. Um, and uh, if uh, you can, so if you pronounce, let's see if you, if you want to produce this vowel U, uh, well, I don't know exactly, it depends of course on the language, I don't know exactly, uh, uh, I mean, at least in, at least for French, we have a nice protrusion of uh, the lips, if you want to say OU. But now if I ask you to say the same OU with a pen in your mouth, you will have automatically, uh, you will be able automatically to find uh, another vocal tract configurations by probably, so I, I, I prevent you from protruding your lips. Automatically, your tongue will be, will move backward and you will be able to find another way to produce a OU. So it means that we have a many to one relation between gesture on one hand and sound on the other hand. And we also know that it's a complex problem because uh, we have to deal with several sources of variability. Uh, we first uh, know, again, for since a long time, that uh, we have some specific anatomy and morphology among speakers, as you can see here, uh, here on this uh, on this uh, MRI scans where you have two speakers, S1 and S2, producing uh, three canonical vowels, uh, E, uh, U, and, uh, and, uh, and E. And you can see that, of course, we have a lot of differences in terms of anatomy and morphology that can interact with the articulatory movements. And we have also some speaker-specific articulatory strategies, means that uh, regardless of the anatomy between speakers, we can have some um, uh, differences in terms of articulatory strategies. And it's even more complex than that because recently uh, it has been shown that we can also have an interaction of both. So anatomy and articulatory strategies that makes this uh, acoustic to articulatory inverse uh, mapping problem uh, even more complex. So um, to continue with this uh, uh, inverse mapping problem, let's uh, talk now about uh, the uh, some kind of a parallel research line that try to uh, model it, but for uh, technological goals. So uh, many studies have tried to embed some kind of model able to link sounds to gestures in speech technology. Uh, for instance, in automatic speech recognitions, uh, people has, uh, have been trying to, to integrate some articulatory prior knowledge, for instance, to improve noise robustness, uh, etc. Um, also in speech synthesis, where people have tried to uh, design speech synthesizers that, that were controlled not only for, by the text, but also by an articulatory input, allowing to have like a more open, uh, for, um, like to control, for instance, the degrees of, um, uh, I mean, some properties of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the phonetic content. And uh, for instance, I've been working for quite a long time on another uh, a project called Visual Biofeedback, where the goal is here to provide to any uh, potential user speakers with an articulation disorders, so for speech therapy uh, applications, to provide uh, him or, or, or uh, him uh, um, uh, visual information about his or, own, or her own articulations. And the, goal, the, the assumption is here that uh, if you see your uh, the, the movements of your in internal articulators, the ones that are difficult to visualize mentally, such as the tongue, you will be able to uh, better correct uh, some potential articula articulation or pronunciation, pronunciation disorder. So here we have uh, an inverse mapping between sound and gesture. And so, uh, but it, most of, uh, of uh, speech technology is based on articulatory data, uh, they, relies on, they rely on uh, first parallel recordings uh, of articulatory and acoustic speech data. So to record articulatory data, we have plenty sensors, uh, plenty possible sensors, uh, usually available in speech labs. Uh, for instance, you have uh, ultrasound uh, to access to the tongue movement in some kind of minimum invasive. Uh, way, or you can put people in the MRI scanner and uh, have this very, very uh, nice uh, MRI scan of the vocal tract. Or we, you can also have this some kind of torture instrument where we glue literally some uh, coils on on some on the on the uh, the articulators, tongue and velum and lips, 
And uh, we put these coils and the, su and the subjects uh, uh, into a magnetic field. And uh, by measuring the, the current uh, in these coils, we can recover the 2D or 3D position of the coils. And with a pretty uh, good temporal and spatial resolution. This is uh, this uh, EMA. I will uh, talk a bit more about uh, EMA in the, in the rest of the talk. So EMA stands for uh, electromagnetic articulography. So when we have recorded uh, in parallel for uh, one or several um, uh, speakers and more importantly for a lot of uh, sentences, uh, we have recorded in parallel on one hand articulatory movement, on the other hand the speech signals, we can take off the shelf uh, the regression techniques that we like and uh, in machine learning world we have plenty, plenty, plenty of techniques so uh, people are trying to model this inverse mapping uh, using, for instance, codebook approach, and then so uh, so some kind of template-based approach, and then uh, of course artificial neural networks with the pioneer work of Richmond, 2004, and then Gaussian mixture model, hidden Markov models, and then DNN uh, came into the game, uh, recurrent neural network became. Uh, popular again, and even more recently, I found some here uh, some 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 work uh, that uh, use um, uh, sequence to sequence model uh, to to address this uh, uh, acoustic to articulatory mapping problem. Uh, in our recent work, we also have tried to move from a 100% supervised training settings into uh, some kind of less supervised uh, training. And this is what we have called semi-supervised approach, where we have tried to minimize the, the, the amount of training data that we have to record for uh, a new speakers by pre-training uh, um, an acoustic to articulatory inverse model on what we have called the reference speaker in the lab. And given only a few uh, sentences and a few recordings of the voice of uh, new speakers, try to adapt uh, or to transfer this acoustic to articulatory model uh, on the f so that it can be compatible to make it compatible with the voice of a new speaker. So this is a technique that we have been calling uh, uh, integrated cascaded Gaussian mixture regression. I won't go into much detail uh, uh, about it, but so it was uh, um, just a, a way to show you that um, in uh, well at least most or even all the speech technology as knows that are uh, based on articulatory data. We rely on a lot of supervision. It means that we provide at each time step some kind of equivalence between vocal tract configuration and spectral content of the uh, corresponding speech signals. Okay, and we do that at each time step for uh, for a lot of of sentences. So we have a lot of supervision. Okay, when we have to learn this. But now, if we go back to developmental learning. And if we see how my daughter has tried to learn this acoustic to articulatory uh, uh, inverse model, well, she was never provided with such a supervision. She has to learn this acoustic to articulatory mapping in what we can say, uh, and this is, this is going to be our working hypothesis here, uh, either in a self or at least in a very, very weakly supervised manner. For a given acoustic target, she has never been provided with an explicit and complete feedback on the corresponding vocal tract configuration. Okay. On the other hand, she has to learn that only from the surrounding ambient speech. Okay. So from audio only speech data. And of course, maybe a bit of interaction with the caregiver, of course. But but the idea is here that she is able to learn this with much less supervision than our, our current uh, uh, speech technologies. So this is um, um, striking uh, for me. And if we see in the literatures, there are already several studies that have tried to understand how we can learn this gesture to sound correspondence in a self-supervised manner. Um, and they have proposed, the studies, um, different computational models of speech acquisition. So uh, I mentioned, for instance, the work of uh, Clément moulin frier of uh, Oko Razanen, and also uh, um, also this. Um, uh, I'd like also this uh, to present this uh, work of uh, Philipsen, 2021. And here I just extracted a, a figure from this paper, 
and you can see that. Uh, so let's let's discuss a bit about how does it work here. We have here uh, an agent, okay, that is trying to learn speech from ambient speech only, okay, and of course this agent has a vocal tract. So he has we have a physical system that can be can produce speech. So from this the perception of ambient speech, we have some kind of inverse model, okay, that will uh, so the, the, the agent is is, uh, is trying to repeat uh, auditory stimuli. So from a stimuli that he is perceiving, or from some uh, endogenous uh, exploration of the vocal tract, we have an inverse model that estimates some motor comment. The motor comment are sent to uh, the uh, vocal tract or to the, the vocal uh, the vocal um, the voice production system. Okay, here we call here we'll go back to the terminology later, but this is called here the forward model. And we produce a speech sound. So we can, the agent can compare the, what he has perceived, what he wants to produce or to repeat from what, uh, with what he has actually um, produced. Okay. And by, to a certain extent, um, minimizing some kind of differences between perception and production, he can adjust both uh, this forward model and more importantly, this inverse model. Okay. So uh, here, we are learning inverse model in a completely different manner than, than, than uh, compared to what we did uh, in in, uh, in the, the previous technologically oriented uh, uh, studies. Yeah. However, most of those models are evaluated on relatively simple linguistic materials that can be isolated vowels or syllables, or also synthetic speech data, not real world and massive speech data. On the contrary, we have another uh, research uh, um, line, uh, which uh, is based on um, this uh, idea of self-supervised deep learning. So the use of deep neural network trained in a self-supervised manner as a tool or, the, or a proxy to study speech and language acquisition. And actually, this is uh, based on this uh, idea uh, uh, of reverse engineering approach as proposed by uh, Dupu in 2016 in a position paper. And if I quote uh, Emmanuel Dupu here, the goal is to um, construct scalable computational models or system that can, when fed with realistic input data, so we, we want here to deal with real world data, mimic language acquisition as it is observed in infants. And there is also a linguist called Tal Linsen that uh, said, if I quote him, uh, the goal of these models can be to design, or they can be used as computational platform to test which innate learning constraints are necessary for speech and language acquisition. What do we need? Uh, what, do we, what do we need to put in the brain of, 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 a, of a child to start to bootstrap the system and start, uh, start learning this uh, relationship between the different uh, speech modalities? And um, as an example of this idea, here on the right side of the slide, you see uh, this um, system proposed by Lacotia et al. in 2001, which is called um, a GSLM for Generative Spoken Language Modeling from Rodeo. And basically, this also can be seen as a model of um, some kind of agent learning to speak um, uh, from uh, only by, 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 by considering only ambient speech, so in a self supervised manner. And the goal is here to repeat uh, an auditory stimulus, okay? And to do that uh, in very in a, in, in in short, uh, how does it work? The first thing uh, when we want to repeat an auditory stimulus, according to this model, is to find some kind of discrete unit, okay? So how does it work here? This acoustic speech signal is encoded via a bunch of uh, self-supervised learning techniques can be uh, contrastive predictive coding, Hubert, wave to vec whatever, any kind of uh, self-supervised learning technique, very popular today. Then those representations, those embeddings, are quantized using some simple k-mean clustering algorithm. And then a TTS model, okay, a text-to-speech model, it's trained, but not from text, but from the sequence of decoded units. Okay. And so it's very interesting because here we have some kind of automatic discovering of the building block of language which can be related to phonemes, but not exactly phonemes. Okay, that can be used for perception and production. And also, what is interesting is that on top of that, uh, they are proposed to train a generative language model, some kind of GPT model, that is trained not only on tokens extracted from words, but from the uh, from decoded uh, units. 
And by given the by given the system some uh, input uh, auditory stimuli, the system can just decode it and predict what comes next, and try and start to generate some kind of speech like uh, speech like uh, um, signals. So it is uh, this uh, speech generation path. So the what is interesting is here that we are uh, uh, we are able here now to, to to build a scalable model that can be trained with massive and raw uh, speech data recorded in the wild. So this is very good, but the drawback is here. The drawback is that for now the articulatory level, okay, so the motor level is almost never considered in the study. So this is what motivates our like new long-term goal of research, which is to build some kind of computational model of speech acquisition, which is based on self-supervised deep learning, but so in line with this research but with explicit access to articulatory or motor knowledge. So um, with such a, a, some kind of deep learning based uh, platform that we want to use to, to question um, uh, acquisition of uh, and the learning of uh, acoustic articulatory uh, relationships, we want to use this model to ask several uh, research questions. The first one is, uh, does articulatory knowledge improve speech representation when they are learned in a self-supervised manner from, from the audio signals? Do we have more robust representation? And uh, I will uh, try to give some uh, preliminary answer to this question by um, um, showing you a study that we have publishing two years ago in oral computation. Um, then the second question is, does an explicit access to articulatory knowledge improve speech decoding, especially in adverse conditions? We know that for human, can we mimic that for, um, okay, let's say AI in short. How inverse acoustic to articulatory mapping can be learned in a self-supervised manner? So this is a crucial question that my daughter has to, uh, to, to face, okay? And I won't have the time to discuss, to, to discuss about this, but we are also interested is in uh, the role of articulatory, articulatory knowledge in the discovery of phonological units. And we have a, a, a paper on, we have publishing a paper recently on that, but I won't have the time to discuss. So, um, how much time? Yeah. So I will start with um, first study, which is, um, try to answer this question, does articulatory knowledge improve speech representation learned in a self-supervised manner? So as you may know, uh, self-supervised learning of speech representation from audio signals is a hot topic uh, nowadays. Many techniques have been proposed, such as um, um, autoregressive predictive coding, um, uh, autoregressive predictive coding, or uh, contrastic predictive coding that have been proposed by Chung et al. or uh, Van der Horde and, and, and Tal in 2019. And here, the pretext task, because when we have to learn, um, um, well, in self-supervised learning, we have to define some kind of pretext task, the task that we want to solve when we want to learn the presentation. So the task here is to predict the future of the speech signal. So you can see here uh, an example, uh, the figure extracted from the paper by Van der, Van der Horde. We have here the let's say the past of auditory speech signals that is sent through a bunch of recurrent neural network. And we have, uh, we obtain some kind of embedding here, or also can be called also context vector, I think in the paper. And the goal here is to um, maximize the mutual information between these embeddings, okay, at time step T and the embeddings in the future, time step T plus one or T plus two or T plus three or T plus four. So this is uh, the, 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 the core of the idea of uh, contrastive predictive coding. Uh, of course, we have also other uh, techniques such as um, uh, Hubert, okay, which in that case is more like masking part of the speech signals and trying to fill the gap, etc. So, but here we are interested in this idea of co uh, predictive coding. So learning speech representation by predicting the future of an auditory uh, stimulus. And um, interestingly, this idea of predictive coding is also central in cognitive and neuroscience. Uh, it has been an idea that has been also uh, popularized by Friston, 
uh, in uh, several, several studies. And uh, Pristan describes the brain as a predictive machine or prediction machine, constantly forming predictions about upcoming input, which guides the interpretation of sensory data. Okay. So in short, when we perceive speech signals, our brain to a better understand it, or maybe to access to a more complex representation, uh, such as motor representations, is constantly predicting the future of the auditory stimulus. The goal is to minimize some kind of prediction error or surprise. So the question is here, um, if we do that, if the brain is doing that, and if it is also very, um, um, if it is a, a, a good idea to do that, to train, um, to learn uh, speech representation in a self-supervised manner, we try to, to ask the question, is there a benefit of exploiting articulatory movements and mainly the lips in addition to auditory speech. Okay. And one of the working hypotheses is that we know that from time to time, not always, but from time to time, the lip movement anticipates the sound. Okay. So when it comes to predict what comes next, if we have an additional piece of information, okay, which, uh, which is available um, um, sooner, then is it a good idea to use it? And uh, can we build more robust representation if we have this additional arbitrary uh, information? So uh, to do that, we did something very simple. Uh, we just trained a model to predict the future of the speech signals, which were encoded either uh, in terms of um, like a compact representation, like a male spectrogram, or even with the raw uh, STFT. Um, so we tried, we, we, we are trying to, to, to uh, predict the future of these signals, so future at to F, so number of frame in the future from the current, the current frame. Okay. The current time step and the previous time step. Okay. So this is for X stands for the audio observations. And we also integrate information about the lips. Okay. So image of the lips at time T or previous images of the lips. So we are here modeling multimodal speech data, audiovisual speech data. And so we train a model. Okay. So F is modeled by a deep neural network. Of course, we have tried different architectures starting from DNN up to recurrent neural network. So we have tried to learn uh, this. So we learned this, uh, this uh, mapping functions on uh, large data sets, uh, which on more or less hundreds of hours of speech data. So I don't, won't go into the detail. This is a, a traditional deep learning cuisine. And the most interesting is probably the results. And uh, so the results are shown here by are summarized by this graph. What we have on the X axis is the uh, is to F. So where we want, uh, so how far we want to predict in the future. Okay, in milliseconds, so from 25 milliseconds up to 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, etc. So do we stay in the same phonemes, the same syllables, or do we go, of course, to the next world? Okay, so we, 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 we went up to 250 milliseconds. And on the y-axis, you have the performance of the uh, predictions, which is expressed in terms of explained variance that can be seen more or less as a correlation coefficient. So the higher, the better. One is perfect uh, prediction and zero is no prediction or at least no correlations. And you have here in a plain uh, line, the prediction, if we consider the audio information only in dashed line, if we consider both the audio and the video, and you have uh, different colors depending on the past context that we consider in the prediction. Okay. Do we rely on the last 25 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, 75 milliseconds? What we can see here is that, of course, if we start to predict ourselves, no problem, it works great. We have learned the identity function, but when we start to learn what's come in the future, so what are the quality of the representations learn, uh, when we try to learn uh, um, representation in a self-supervised manner and predicting the next uh, 50 milliseconds, for instance, well, we have, let's say, 0 0.7 more or less uh, correlations. Okay, so it's not bad, but 
still it's not a, we are not very far in the future and we are we are losing a lot of uh, prediction uh, power and if we go up to if you go up to 50 milliseconds or even 100 milliseconds we have quite a very bad predictions okay so it's a bit surprising for, for me that uh, that those self supervised learning techniques are used and are, are very powerful or they are said to be very powerful uh, but when we look to what they are really encoded in those uh, in, the, in those predictions that we are well, we are not able basically to to I mean the performance is is is, is not as high as expected. Okay, so when it comes to the role of particular movements here, as you can see, is that we have we do have a benefit of relying on leap information when it comes to predict the future of the speech signals, but it's small, right? It's small. It's a uh, more or less one point like zero point one up, up to zero point like yes less than zero point one uh, of uh, uh, um, for for the correlation. Okay, so this is this distance where, that we have here. Okay, so um, um, the conclusion of this study is that um, well training uh, learning uh, speech representation in the self supervised manner using these predictive coding techniques seems to be a good idea, but we have to keep in mind that if we are going too far in the future, of course, as expected, we are uh, we have a performance drop, which is quite high, and we do have a benefit of relying on uh, leap movements, okay, to improve the quality of the prediction. Okay, so this is for the first research question that we wanted to test. The second one is: Does an explicit access to uh, arbitrary knowledge improve speech decoding in adverse conditions? So as I said in my introductions, we know for sure that, um, uh, I mean, at least relying on leap information helps uh, um, helps um, decoding speech in noise. So we have tried to push this idea a bit further, and uh, in particular, we have tried to uh, we we have we 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 work on uh, another popular technique. In uh, self-supervised learning, which is called um, a variational autoencoder. So a variational autoencoder is uh, is um, sketched here uh, as this, uh, let's say, uh, neural network with this uh, diabolo uh, shape. So a variational autoencoder is an autoencoder. So it takes uh, inputs. Uh, it, it takes uh, here a speech uh, speech features as as input and data as input and try to reconstruct it. Uh, at the output, and it has two parts: an encoder that will project the data into some kind of latent space, and a and a decoder that will generate some data from the latent code. And the variational autoencoder can be seen as a probabilistic version of an autoencoder, since we, in the latent space, at what we have at the output of the encoder is not directly a uh, latent code, but it's a probability distribution, uh, and that we can sample from it. To uh, uh, to uh, get the latent code, and it's the same for for the decoder. So in the rest of the talk, the latent space will be uh, noted as classically as Z, whereas the, the 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 data is denoted as X. So what we are trying to do is uh, to train first the speech denoiser. So something that is trying to denoise speech by taking noisy speech as input and try to output the clean version of the speech signals. But the idea was uh, that if we do have access when we perceive speech signals to arbitrary data or at least motor comments, so what about um, constraining the latent space of this variational autoencoder so that it includes explicitly some arbitrary knowledge. So we want to shape the, the latent space so that it has more or less the same shape as an articulatory uh, space. So how we, uh, how, how we did that? So first, we built what we called an articulatory model. So this is completely independent from the VAE. This is something that we do, uh, um, that we have to do first. So how we do that? We start by uh, um, uh, we start from a data set of uh, EMA data, so arbitrary data, and we uh, do some kind of statistical analysis of this arbitrary data by doing what we call a guided PCA. So basically, the idea is to 
um, is to extract the latent dimension of this uh, arbitrary space. But we could have done a simple PCA, okay, to to extract the ma the maximum direction of the of the of the of the movements of the vocal tract. But if we do that, we face a, a classical problem. I won't go into much detail. Is that the problem is that if we want to separate or to disentangle the movement of the jaw and the lips or the jaw and the tongue, you first have to subtract the movement of the jaw from all the uh, movements of tongue and lips. And then you can do uh, um, a simple linear decomposition to extract the maximum directions of the movement for the tongue and for the lips. So this is what we call a guided PCA. But for in short, we can see it as a simple linear decomposition of the raw articulatory data. And what we get is, uh, I don't, I, I hope you can see this uh, little animation here. So what we have here on uh, this uh, figure, we have uh, some uh, the representation in the vocal tract space. So we have in purple three coils attached on the tongue. The tongue tip is here on the left. We have this blue uh, point, which is the jaw. And here we have two uh, coils on the lips, upper lips and lower lips. Okay. So uh, by applying this guided PCA on a large data set of articulatory data, we have we are able to build this articulatory model that is a model which has a few parameters, okay, less parameters than the number of uh, like the number of parameters in the EMA space. And those parameters, let's say they have some kind of uh, phonological meaning. For instance, we can control independently the jaw from the tongue from the lips. Okay, so here you can see that we move the parameters, the artificial parameters, and you can see here the impact on the on the well the correspondence in the vocal tract space. Okay, so so we now have for a particular speaker an articulatory model of these speakers. Oh, by the way, I think that this animation is not correctly placed. This is uh, the 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 work of uh, my my wonderful PhD students, Marc Antoine George. Um, so this is the first step. The step two, the second step is to constrain some of the latent variables of this variational autoencoder so that they have the same distribution as, as these seven arbitrary parameters. So to do that, we initially proposed, uh, uh, we have proposed a, a simple method in another context, so uh, which, has, which was the, the goal was to control the latent space uh, of, a, of a VAE for um, changing the, some property of, uh, of uh, music synthesizer sound. And so the, this technique is properly uh, described in this paper. So we have just applied it uh, here on articulatory data. So uh, how does it work? Basically, everything is done in the loss function that is used to train the variational autoencoder. So for those who are not familiar with this uh, variational autoencoder, the first term of this uh, loss is the reconstruction loss. Okay, so we want to have the output as good as the input. Okay, and this is a reconstruction loss. The second one is some the kubler leibler divergence. Okay, that tells you measure the distance between the output of the encoder and the prior that we can put on the latent space. Okay, so this is uh, the two the two terms are the typical terms uh, the, the the terms used in uh, conventional VAE, and we had a second uh, a third term. Sorry. Okay. And the third term is the following, okay, is the goal is to, for each of the uh, latent variables, we train the model so that they approximate, the, okay, the value of each articulatory parameters associated with an acoustic observation. Okay. So here we have here uh, some kind of uh, uh, supervision here because we have to know for a given observation, uh, for a given observation, we have to know the correspondence between speech and the uh, articulatory data, or at least the articulatory parameters, okay? So the model is trained to, uh, to, so that we have at the end of the training for each Z here, Z1, Z2, Z3, Z4, up to Z6, we have um, force the value of each Z so that it has the same, um, it varies similarly to as articulatory parameters. And the rest of the latent variable are just let unconstrained, uh, unconstrained. So 
we have evaluated this model on, uh, of course, we train, we have the artificial information for one speaker. And we are uh, interesting in also uh, assessing the possibility of the model to deal with unseen speaker. So as a child, for instance, we have to perceive noisy speech signals and has to infer some kind of motor command to separate the speech from the noise. Uh, so we have uh, trained uh, uh, okay, some speaker dependent model. Speaker dependent means we have one reference speaker for which we have the articulatory data. The encoder and decoder are very simple, three layers DNN. And the speech signal is uh, analyzed and reconstructed with uh, well, some parameters compatible with the uh, neural vocoder LPCNet, which has nice property for, for what we are doing because we have some kind of source and filter uh, separation in this uh, neural vocoder. So uh, in these two graphs, we have some evaluation of these models. So we have in uh, here uh, in bl uh, blue, we have the traditional VAE. And in orange, we have our models that we called RRVIE for articulatory regularized VIE. So we regularize the latent space of the VIE using articulatory data. So we have two data sets, uh, PP2009 uh, and another data set. I won't go into much details. Uh, and we are interested in the capacity of the model to reconstruct speech from noise, noisy speech, to produce clean speech from noisy speech. So we measure the performance with different noise to signal ratio that we can control. Okay, from starting from no noise up to a lot of noise. Okay, as much noise in the signals as uh, the, the noise that we have to the signal. And uh, we have here an, an objective evaluation conducted by, train, uh, by using an automatic speech recognition system, HMM based, that basically assess the quality of the, the intelligibility of the denoise uh, speech signals. And we have some kind of perceptual evolu uh, evaluation using a, a Mushra test. What we can see is that uh, when we have constrained the, the VIE with uh, some articulatory parameters, we have a slight improvement. Okay, we have a slight improvement. Like here, we have the better accuracy, so less um, smaller phoneme error rate for the ESR. Uh, and we have a slight better pref pref uh, preference for our method than the standard VIE for the perceptual test. But as you can see, that for this perceptual evaluation, it's significant when we have no noise or small noise, but then it's not significant when we have much more noise uh, in, the, in the input speech signals. So in short, our model slightly outperforms VIE. So we do have a benefit of regularizing the latent space with, let's say, motor knowledge, but no massive effect. I can show you some examples and you will see that it's difficult to listen, to hear um, um, some, some uh, some differences. So the first, I will play the speech that has to be denoised, and then the result by the VAE, and then the result by the articulatory regularized VAE. Uh, okay. Comment l'as-tu su? It's in French. It's comment l'as-tu su? Comment l'as-tu su? So denoised by the VAE. Comment l'as-tu su? And denoised by the uh, articulatory regularized VAE. And another example. Louis pense à ça. Louis pense à ça. Louis pense à ça. VAE, and RVA. So it's a bit better, but no massive effect. Okay. How much time do I have left? I think uh, I might, my, I, I forgot to, to, to check when we started, but anyway, um, I, I think I can finish in like 10 minutes. Is it okay, uh, Inma? Yeah. I see you. Okay. Okay. Let's let's move on. Okay. Thanks, uh, Alex. So this was for the second study. Now we I will finish the talk with a third study, uh, the one that I think I I'm very uh, excited about. And again, this is the great uh, work of uh, PhD students Marc Antoine George that I co-supervised with uh, Jean Luc Schwartz. And the question is uh, uh, is how we can um, uh, build this kind of self-supervised model, deep learning, uh, uh, I mean, self-supervised deep learning model to question how a child can learn this inverse acoustic to articulatory mapping in a self-supervised manner. So um, as I started to say in my introduction, um, 
we, we, we build our model on top of the motor control theory, and in particular, the uh, speech motor control theory, um, and the one uh, proposed, well, I, part of, I'm very inspired by the work by Frank Gunther and also uh, from Ude and, and, and Perrier. So let's um, um, talk a bit about this um, motor control model. So the uh, first here is the starting point is uh, the sensory target. So sensory target is what is the sound that we want to produce? And this sensory target is defined in terms of uh, it's an acoustic target. Okay, it's an acoustic target. It's a it's a point that we want to reach in the acoustic space. So to produce it, we have to infer some kind of motor command. Okay, so this is the role of this inverse model that we want to learn. And this motor command, we send that to the flesh. Okay, and to activate our muscles, we produce the sound, and we have possibility to monitor the quality of the produced speech and this is a, this sensory feedback so we have a feedback control okay we can compense we can um, we can uh, adjust our motor command and so that we can uh, based on our sensory feedback so that we can uh, progressively reach the this acoustic target okay, so this um, loop here control loop uh, is a Often called, it's, it's often called the feedback control loop. It's involved at the early stage of learning, and also when we want to repeat uh, a sound or produce in adverse condition. It's also known to be a slow loop. Why it's slow? Because we have to wait until the execution of the motor command, okay, to really produce the sound, and based on the production, adjust in line our uh, uh, motor command. Okay, so this is one of the second loop. So this is why in most models we have another control loop, which is called the fit forward control. That I can I see it uh, as an automatic pilot, which is faster. So how does it work? So basically we have here the if we we start again with the sensory target, we extract some kind of motor command that that will be sent to the to the to the vocal tract to produce a speech sound. But they are also sent to what we call the forward model. And the goal of the forward model is to internalize or to approximate internally to have a model of the, uh, of the voice production system, but in the brain, okay? So that this forward model can predict the sensory feedback without executing the sound, okay? Uh, sorry, without executing the motor command. So based on the prediction of the forward internal model that are available uh, before the execution of the uh, and the production of the sound, so they are available sooner, we can adjust the motor command, okay, and in line, progressively uh, come closer to the target that we want to reach. Okay, so we basically in those models we have three components: the inverse model, first component the one that we try to learn in a self-supervised manner. We have some kind of um, uh, physical systems that uh, execute some motor command and produce sounds. And we have some kind of another model, okay, an internal model that try to mimic or actually to, to, to model this uh, motor execution. So what we are trying to do is trying to replicate this model of speech motor control uh, with uh, deep neural networks. So this is what we did. We started um, from uh, we started by modeling the flesh, so the, the 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 voice production system. So to do that, we took our uh, we took a, 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 a parallel corpus of articulatory and acoustic data, and we build what we call an articulatory synthesizer. So that takes as input an articulatory comment, which is defined as a set of articulatory parameters similarly to what I presented for the previous study on VAE. Okay, so we define basically the movement of tongue, lips, and jaw in a vector of six parameters. 
and we out, the output of the of the synthesizer is some kind of compact representation of the speech signals. It can be MFCC, it can be mass spectrogram, it can be raw STFC, whatever. So this uh, synthesizer is called phi here, and it it's, uh, approximates the physical system. So the physical system is a uh, train, and it, well, say the, the, let's say that the, 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 the child is born with it. So when it's trained, it's frozen. Okay, it's just an articulatory synthesizer. Interesante, pero está muy lejos de lo nuestro. All right. I... Should I stop? Should I proceed? Should I? No. I don't know. Okay. Let's move on. So this is. Um, so, okay. So then what we have on top of this artificial synthesizer is the inverse model. The inverse model take ambient speech, can be the one for the caregiver, and uh, and do this acoustic to artificial inversion. So recover some artificial movements from a perceived auditory stimulus. We then also have the forward model, okay? The forward model try to approximate the physical um, physical uh, process, okay? So the artificial synthesizer. And both our forward synthesizer and inverse model are implemented as uh, deep neural networks. So the forward model and the synthesizer are um, fit forward neural network. Don't remember exactly the details, three or four layers, a bunch of neurons, very, but very simple uh, architecture. And the inverse model is a recurrent neural network because we know that because it is a nil-pose problem relying on the contextual information is useful when it comes to uh, inverse the speech signal. Okay, so when it's trained, so, 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 so the goal is to uh, pre-train this synthesizer and then freeze it and train jointly the inverse model and the forward model, but without any supervision on arbitrary data. We just want to train it with uh, raw audio, okay, to, to mimic uh, how a child will learn this uh, inverse mapping process from the ambient speech only. So how we do that? Well, we have adapted, uh, uh, well, let, so we have adapted something called the uh, accommodation, accommodation learning uh, algorithm. So this is how it works. So we start by uh, uh, an input uh, auditory stimulus, S, the model, okay, inverse, in, uh, the model recovers some kind of articulatory movements. Of course, uh, after initialization of the weight of those neural networks, okay, this uh, articulatory movement is, has nothing to do with the uh, perceived auditory uh, stimulus, okay? It's, uh, it's gibberish. But this articulatory movement is sent to the articulatory synthesizer. And from a given articulatory uh, comment, the synthesizer is able to produce to produce a speech a speech signal. The speech signals, of course, again, has nothing to do with the perceived. So the, at this stage, the child is not able to produce it. But by using this synthesizer, we are now able to create some kind of um, knowledge, okay, some kind of repertoire that associates articulatory command to uh, to uh, uh, produce speech signal. Okay, so this is uh, oh I should have clicked. We have the inverse mapping. We have this inter inter uh, articulatory synthesis. Okay, so this motor command okay is also sent to the forward model. So of course the forward model after initialization is not good. Okay, so it means that the predicted audio output is very very far also from the audio input. Okay. So what we do is first we will update the forward model. So the forward model, remember, try to approximate the synthesizer. So the loss here is some kind of, uh, I mean, it reflects the discrepancies between predicted audio output by the forward model and the audio output predicted by the synthesizer, okay? So we want the forward model to approximate the uh, physical voice production system. And then we back propagate uh, um, we, we train the inverse model, and the inverse model here, uh, to, to update it, okay, we try to backpropagate the, uh, 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 the, the error given by another loss function here, which measures the discrepancies between 
the uh, synthetic audio output, what has been really produced, and the perceived one. Okay? So we can backpropagate the information from here up to here and to uh, optimize the weight of the, of the inverse model. Okay? So of course, uh, the, the, the goal is to have some kind of, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, uh, of the, the goal is to have um, to, 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 have, to bootstrap the system. So I perceive the speech signals. I in, infer some artificial movements that are um, gibberish. But from this artificial movements, I sample my vocal tract so that I'm able to produce uh, true synthetic audio output. Okay. And so, but this link is, is governed by, by physics, right? So this one is always good, okay? And so by doing that, I start to uh, sample my vocal tract and build some kind of repertoire, okay? And by, uh, uh, hopefully, I'd be able to bootstrap the system and I, I will be able to, uh, to uh, by minimizing this, I, uh, next time, next iteration, I will have a better inverse uh, model. So, better articulatory comments, and then uh, again and again, up until convergence of, of the inverse model. So does it work? So to test it, we test it on, uh, again, uh, uh, we, we, we build a, a, some kind of agent based on, on this technique. Uh, so we have uh, uh, some kind of pre-trained articulatory synthesizer here, trained on um, an hour of, of uh, jointly acoustic and articulatory speech data that we, we kept uh, frozen. And then we expose this uh, agent to ambient speech. So uh, basically not from, like say, less, less an hour. Okay. And we iteratively update the forward model and the inverse model. We are forward model and inverse model until convergence. So this is the evolution of these two loss function uh, when we train the model. This is the number of epoch here. And you will see that in blue, you have the, uh, the loss function associated to the forward model, which is good, which is good. I mean, we have a, a, like some kind of smooth evolution. It means that very quickly, the, the forward model is able to approximate the articul articulatory synthesizer. It's not really the case for the inverse uh, model. You see that we have uh, from time to time, it's much more uh, noisy, okay? The, the, the learning curves of the inverse model is much more noisy, okay? It is also because we sometimes uh, we, we, we have very, very bad uh, predictions. So if we have a very bad prediction, we have, uh, we have, um, we have some kind of trap in some kind of, uh, of local minima that leads to very, very poor uh, speech signal. But at the end, okay, we are able to learn this inverse mapping, but again, in a self-supervised manner. We never provided a S A pair. So uh, here are some results that I found interesting. The first one is uh, here for this uh, vowel E. So here we have a constant vowel here. Uh, of course, the model has been trained on uh, natural sentences, but it's nice also to see what's going on on simple phonemes. Here we have E. Here you have here the true articulatory parameters, or let's say the expected articulatory parameters. So it's a vowel, so we have a stable vocal tract configurations. So you can see that the parameters that have, be, that have been uh, inverted automatically uh, are a bit more noisy, but it's okay if you have here in uh, the vocal tract uh, space, the difference between the original in red and the predicted in blue, and you can see that the tongue, jaw, and lips are placed correctly. And then if we send to the sound, so, the, so, we, in, in the, so if we listen to the sound uh, produced by our child, okay, uh, you will see that uh, it matches quite well the perceived uh, auditory uh, stimulus. So the target is me pronouncing the vowel e, e. and the synthesis is our child uh, trying to learn, uh, that I've learned to repeat uh, this e by finding the good artic articulatory strategy. E. So you should be able to identify e. So we say, oh, it works. Actually, no, it does not. Let's see it on this more complex logatome, ABBA. And ABBA, as you can imagine, we have the lips that are, should be closed when you say B, okay? And we have a portion of silence, right? And this portion of silence is complicated when it comes to acoustic to articulatory inversion because 
during this silence, you can have you have a, a strong uncertainty on the on the vocotract configurations. So what do we have here? We have ABBA. So the expected one was this, okay, and the inverse one was this. So it's a bit different. But what happened here if we see what's going on during silence? So during silence, this is this vertical bar, and here I plotted the correspondence here. Okay, the correspondence is is here. But before we analyze this in terms of articulatory strategies, let's hear to the, 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 the quality of the intelligibility of the sound produced by the children. So again, the target was me pronouncing ABBA. ABBA. And what is uh, what uh, the synthesis is what uh, our child has repeated. ABBA. It's ABBA. Oh, we should be happy with that. But the problem is that to produce this ABBA, our uh, child has found an articulatory, articulatory strategies which is very far from what we expected. Here you can see that instead of closing the lips, okay, here you can see that in uh, the original here is in red, so the, our, the, the expected lip movement were some kind of closed lips, we are, our child who kept uh, uh, his uh, lips wide open, but where is the closure? Where the closure is coming from? Well, it's come. It's coming from. Uh, well, we don't know exactly. It's come mostly. Um, it's most likely come from the jaw. Okay, the jaw is completely closed here, and even here we have this the tongue. Okay, the tongue is very close to the palate. So basically, instead of closing the vocal tract by closing the lips, we close the vocal tract pretty much everywhere. Okay, so we do have here learned uh, an inverse model in a self-supervised manner, so we now have a child able to, uh, he is able to repeat speech by inferring some articulatory movements and then send that to uh, some kind of uh, artificial vocal tract. But there is still, uh, a I mean, there is room for improvements because here we have to uh, deal with some articulatory strategies that are absolutely not, um, um, I mean, uh, compatible with what we know from, from, from what, what, what humans are doing. So uh, this is uh, the end of, of this talk. I will end by a few conclusions and perspectives. So um, I've tried to, um, I mean, I showed you a bunch of uh, studies where we are we're using some kind of um, self-supervised learning techniques based on deep neural networks to um, question the underlying mechanisms of um, uh, speech learning with a focus on this problem of acoustic to articulatory mapping. Um, we have uh, presented some, um, so we have uh, some, some so the, for, for now, what we have been able to show is that uh, we do see some benefit of relying on articulatory data when it comes to learn speech representation in a self supervised manner. So we study that through the paradigm of uh, predictive coding. Uh, we have tried to uh, regularize the latent space of uh, autoencoders, in particular rational autoencoders, by showing a, a significant but small benefit of relying on articulatory prior knowledge when decoding speech in adverse condition. And then all this uh, allows us to design some kind of computational model of speech acquisition inspired by uh, the, some series in uh, speech motor control. And the current perspective of this is, uh, I mean, we have a lot of perspective, of course. And one of the first one is to introduce biomechanical constraints in the inverse model, okay, to, to uh, avoid having such uh, weird articulatory strategies. Also to investigate the role of this representation for discovery, discovering phonological units. And we have a paper, we had a paper last year on that at Interspeech. And of course, once we have developed this platform, the goal is to uh, compare the performance of this models with real uh, data uh, and of course uh, developmental data and uh, and hopefully uh, neurophysiological data so that's the end of my talk thank you again for inviting me and i'm uh, ready to answer to question if you have thank you very much thomas very 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 interesting talk we have short time for questions if there are questions among the the public, you can raise your hand. 
No questions. Uh, sorry. Well, I would put a lot of questions, but for, um, I suppose that you have just tried this with, with yourself, I mean, with one only speaker. And is this, can, uh, how do you expect the inter-speaker viability of your, of your system? In theory, it should, it should be a speaker independent once the baby learns. Or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, what, the, if you, what if you pre-train and then you start with another speaker, or uh, how this how that, is this inter-speaker variability in your? That's, um, that's a uh, that's really the, the 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 issue that we have we are facing right now. We have so if I just try to rephrase uh, what you have said is uh, you're right. Uh, so here we have an agent which is trained on with some data from a particular speaker. Of course, not a child, but <laughs> we want glue coils on this nice girl. But we take a <laughs> reference speaker, and then and then we, we, we the system is is learned to produce. I mean, it's trying to 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 deal with uh, um, speech from from different speakers. And actually, we I should have said Marc Antoine, George, a few students. He tried. Many things, because as you uh, have guessed uh, correctly, is that uh, we have this problem of speaker normalization, which means that here what we have asked to for the inverse model to do is to uh, be able to uh, recover in the vocal tract space of the reference speakers, okay, some kind of gestures, but from the acoustics of from a large variety of speakers. So. It has to implement not only acoustic to articulatory mapping, but also speaker normalization. And that's a, a problem. Uh, so what we have been trying to do is, um, so the first thing what we are trying to do is try to extract some kind of features uh, that should be more or less speaker independent using typical signal based processing techniques such as vocal tract length normalization, etc. Uh, also, keep in mind that what we want to have is something which is plausible uh, from a cognitive point of view. Okay. For instance, we could have used, and we have we have tried to use pre-train, uh, pre-train representation uh, learning system. For instance, we can pre-train some kind of Hubert wave to vec, uh, but on on a large number of speakers, and then uh, this will uh, do the job because uh, probably the embeddings that we have are more or less speaker independent. So, so we can then use them as features to, to train the system, but we won't, didn't want to do that because, well, uh, nothing, nothing guarantees that the, the, the child in his brain has already some kind of, uh, of uh, speaker normalization, pre-trained uh, speaker normalization mechanisms. So we wanted to see, what, can we learn it from scratch? Okay, so basically what we, we, do, we did two things. The first thing is that, so first we try uh, signal-based processing method to normalize a bit uh, the, the spectral characteristic for each speaker. So some kind of form on dispersion, stuff like that. Uh, well, difficult. Second thing, we try to uh, also add, I didn't put that on the slide, but we put a, a front end, which is a voice conversion front end. So in that case, uh, what we did is that we tried to convert the voice of the caregivers into the voice of our uh, child before uh, recovering articulatory movements. And so this, 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 uh, uh, I mean, this, this works. But the problem is that a small error on this normalization procedures will lead to a big error in the artic articulatory movements. So, uh, so we did that. Uh, the second thing that we did, and um, well, Marc Antoine is about to release this uh, to this uh, new architecture, is that this study is uh, this agent is is probably very far from what we are really doing when we talk to uh, somebody or we try to or the child is doing when he's trying to repeat or to learn speech because learning speech is more or less learning a code, right? We we want to we want to 
if we speak together, is that because we are conveying the same code. So, but the, the child is here, uh, what he's trying to do is try to mimic not only the code, but the, the timber of the voice, right? Because the loss function is here to minimize discrepancies, but in the spectral domain, okay? But this is probably very far from what we are doing when we are, a child is learning uh, how, to, how to speak. It does not try to uh, copy the, the, exactly the spectral characteristic of the, of the mother. Of course, we have some chameleon effect, accommodation effect, but, but this is probably not the goal. The goal is at least to uh, repeat, and, 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 and even when we give a feedback signal to the child, Probably what we do is just to, we just say that, okay, I understood what you say, right? Yes, it is banana, it is a, a balloon, etc., etc. So we share the same code, okay? So based, what, what we are trying to do right now is trying to, not trying to minimize the, uh, to minimize the discrepancies between predicted speech and perceived speech, but trying to some kind, maximize some kind of uh, a classification uh, so if we, if we, if I decode the, uh, input stimuli, uh, in terms of discrete units, and then if I produce, uh, a, a speech, and if I also decode my produced speech in terms of, uh, discrete units, does the two set of discrete units matches or not? Okay. So instead of having some kind of regression problem, I'm now turned that into more like a classification problem. I maximize some kind of uh, similarity, but uh, between categorical data and not some, uh, you know, continuous data. Okay, so this is what we do. And, and, and uh, this is also a good way to uh, learn uh, uh, an inverse model with better generalization capacity when it comes to unseen speaker. This, this will be my answer. Thank you. Thank you. So, if there are no questions from the from the audience, uh, I think we are we finished the seminar here. Thank you very much again, uh, Thomas, for for accepting the invitation. And Ari, I don't know if you want to put the slide for the next webinars. Maybe. Yes, so thank you very much. Um, I invite you all to attend our next webinars. The next one will be from, from, uh, from Isabel Augenstein in the 2nd of March. So that's all. Thank you all for attending, especially to Thomas. Thank you, Inma. Thank you, everybody, for attending. and. Uh... Yeah. See you anytime See you. in Grenoble if you. Yes. If you are. <laughs> yes. Bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye.